Our Bible word is Mark 6 verses 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. So this is Jesus. He's about to teach and also give the people food there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now, let's first have a look at the context of the Gospel of Mark, when it was written, etc. And yeah, unfortunately, the evidence is not so conclusive. It's a bit confusing. Early church tradition, according to this one early church figure called Papias, he said that the Gospel of, of Mark was written by Mark based on the teaching of Peter, while Peter was in Rome. And this is mentioned by Eusebius. Eusebius was a church historian, and he quoted this writing of Papias. And Papias, he was a bishop of Hierapolis in Asia Minor until about 130 AD. And he said he got this information from a figure called John the Elder. Now, Papias describes that Mark was Peter's interpreter or his translator. So Peter, he, as best he could remember, he gave this, or remembered these teachings and he spoke it in Aramaic, his home language, or his mother tongue, and then Mark translated it into Greek. And if this is so, then it, this would have happened in Rome sometime maybe in the 50s, or 60s. Some scholars though question this because they say that if you read Mark it's it's more closely associated with Paul or the theology of Paul because remember Peter and Paul they had this confrontation in Antioch about table fellowship with Gentiles Peter withdrew from table fellowship with Gentiles and Mark's gospel actually says that Jesus declared all foods clean. So that's more in line with Paul's theology and what we encounter in Paul's letters. Also what we encounter is that Mark's gospel has a very strong emphasis on the cross or the crucifixion of Jesus, which is also very close to the theology of Paul. Now, if you read the New Testament, there is a mark that's variously associated with either Peter or Paul. Let's first look at Paul. Well, John Mark is first mentioned and in Acts, and there he, he was the son of a certain Mary, and this Mary had a house church in Jerusalem. And this was a place also that Peter went to. We can read that in Acts 12, verse 12. But this John Mark also accompanied his cousin Barnabas and Paul on their first missionary journey. And we can read that in there in Acts 12 and 13. And Paul also mentions a mark in his epistles. We find that in Colossians 4 verses 10 and also in Philemon 24. And these epistles were perhaps written while Paul was in prison in Rome in 60 to 62 AD. A mark, however, is also associated with Peter. And that we read about in 1 Peter 5 verses 13, where Peter sends greetings from my son Mark. So, we have here that perhaps this comes from Rome because Paul was in Rome in, from 60 to 62 AD. Peter also came to Rome at a stage. So, maybe this... It refers to this John Mark as we encountered in, in Acts also, but we cannot be sure that this is the same Mark that is referred to by one in 1 Peter and also by Papias. Remember what I said? Papias said that Peter or Mark was Peter's translator or interpreter in Rome. Other scholars also question that this could really come from Peter because the emphasis of the gospel was a lot on Galilee. 
This is where Jesus will appear to his disciples. And also, we also find something in Mark 13, verses 14, where the author writes there, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So that piece, let the reader understand, that indicates that those reading or receiving this gospel are not in Rome. They are somewhere in Judea or Galilee. And it's, and it's relevant to the time of the war, the, the, or the great revolt that dates between 66 to 70 AD. Because it will be applicable to these people this warning flee to the mountains because this war is happening the Romans are coming they're on their way to this you know and they're also going to destroy the temple which they eventually did in 70 AD so it also might be that it was written in Rome because some Latin terms also appear in the gospel for example if you go to Mark 12, verses 42, where the author writes of the widow's two, lepta, and those are Greek coins. And he says they are the equivalent to a quadrans, which is a Roman coin. This and many other instances in the gospel also may suggest that, yes, this was written in Rome. But some scholars question it. So we have two options here. Either this gospel, like Papaya says, was written by Mark, based on the teaching of Peter in Rome, and perhaps this happened in the 50s and 60s. Or alternatively, maybe this gospel was written in Galilee, perhaps in the year six, sometime between the year 66 to 70 AD. And it's, scholars also refer to it as a wartime gospel, because it's relevant to the wartime, that great revolt that happened around this period. So we cannot be sure exactly when the gospel was written. Anyway, the gospel, it's the portrayal of Jesus we encounter in the gospels. Yeah, Jesus is the most down to earth, so to speak, of all the betrayals we encounter in the gospels. Because he exhibits a whole wide range of emotions like compassion or anger or grief and amazement. He also experiences great anxiety when he was when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus also has limited knowledge. For example, there also in chapter 13, he says, we do not know when, when the Son of Man will come. Even the Son, in other words, the Son of God himself doesn't know when it will happen. Even so, Jesus is powerful in this gospel. Jesus comes to Galilee like a hurricane, not a destructive force, but he is a, is a force, he's a powerful presence. Because he comes there, he teaches, he heals, he performs exorcisms, etc. If we go to the beginning of the gospel, if you look at his teaching, people are astonished at what he says. If we go to verse 22, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So Jesus is this amazing teacher. He, and also he performs all these miracles, his exorcisms. He walks on water. He, he multiplies loaves and fishes. He's, he's this incredible force that moves through Galilee. And people are amazed and awestruck by him. And often people ask, who is this? They cannot believe who this is, the power. And of course, for the gospel, it's clear Jesus is the mighty Messiah and the Son of God. He's the one that is here to establish God's kingdom amongst God's people. And also accompanying this is what is known as the messianic secret. Because quite often Jesus, he performs an exorcism and then he instructs the demons, don't tell anybody that this has happened. Also when Peter acknowledges Jesus, you are the Christ, 
the son of the living God. Jesus tells him, don't tell anybody. So there's this motif of secrecy also running throughout the entire gospel. It kind of, it's as if it hides Jesus' identity as the Messiah. And perhaps it has to do with Jesus being a different kind of Messiah. He's not the usual Messiah that people expected. He would, he would come and fight against the Romans. As a gospel narrative unfolds, it becomes clear, Jesus as a Messiah, he must suffer. He must die. He must be tortured to death on the cross. And that went entirely against the understanding of the time of what the Messiah would be. Jesus is this mighty force, this mighty presence. He rushes through Galilee. He amazes people. They, they ask, who is this? This is incredible. We haven't seen something like this before. And of course, Jesus was this powerful human being. He's the son of God who brings or inaugurates God's kingdom on the earth. Our textual unit is, we go to chapter 6, and there are two textual units that we need to be aware of. The first one, and it's most applicable, is 6 verses 30 to 34, and that is the provision of rest in the wilderness. But also, after that, verses 35 to 44, where the provision of bread in the wilderness, because they both relate to the same theme. And if we go to chapter 6, from verse 30, there we find the disciples. Jesus previously has sent them away on their mission in Galilee. He has given them authority to exercise demons and also to teach about the kingdom of God. And now, also many people have started following them. But now they've returned to Jesus and of course the crowd came with the disciples. So the disciples, they give feedback to Jesus, uh, what has happened during the time of their mission. And Jesus says, okay, let's go to another deserted place. They, of course, for, for them to rest, the evangelist writes there, they didn't have time to eat. They were so busy with the people. So they climb into a boat with Jesus to go and rest somewhere in the wilderness. But the crowd who followed the apostles, <laughs> they followed Jesus and his disciples to the place where they landed on the shore. So if we read there in verse 33, But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, that's Jesus, and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. So somewhere there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, Again, the disciples couldn't rest because now the crowd was with them again. And now Jesus, now we come to our, our Bible word. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. Now there are two motifs that come through also here in chapter 6. The one is, is about having a rest in the wilderness. And of course, when the exile, or sorry, not the exiles, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, they were promised rest. In other words, when they reached the promised land. So there's this motif of the exodus that's also present here. But also there's another motif here of Jesus being the king, the, the son of David or king like David. So there are connections between our Bible word and some Old Testament texts. Let's first go to Numbers 27. Because there a connection is established between Jesus and Moses. And also Joshua who took over from Moses. If you go to Numbers 27 verse 17. So it reads there, Who may go out before them? And go in before them. Who may lead them out and bring them in. That the congregation of the Lord may not be like a sheep which have no shepherd. Yeah, Moses is praying to God. He says, God, please, when I depart, give your people a good leader. And of course, this was Joshua. So yeah, there's this theme of Jesus is the Moses. 
or the new Moses who is leading the new Exodus. Because the Exodus, the people, they are in the wilderness. And this is now where Jesus and this big crowd also finds themselves, a place in the wilderness. Now, of course, the Joshua was appointed. His Hebrew name is Yehoshua. And Yehoshua means Yahweh is salvation or Yahweh saves. And in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, his name Yehoshua was translated as Jesus, which is exactly the same what we encounter in the New Testament for Jesus. Jesus himself, he had the shortened form of the name Yehoshua, Yeshua. And Yeshua in the New Testament is also written in Greek as Jesus. So in a sense, Jesus is the Moses, who is the leader of the Exodus, but also he's Joshua. He is the one who takes over and leads the people to the promised land. So that's one theme that we encounter here. That, that this Exodus motif. The people who are here and the disciples with Jesus, they are participating in a new Exodus. Another text that's also important for us is Ezekiel. And here God promises the people... I'm going to give you a new king, a righteous shepherd that will look after you. And we find this in Ezekiel chapter 34. God says it to the prophets, So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field, and they were scattered. So this refers to the corrupt kings who didn't look after their people. And, of course, that led to the exile and the destruction of the temple in 587-86 BC. So God promises here, I will give them a shepherd who will look after my people so that they are not scattered. And then later on in Ezekiel, if we go to verses 22 to 25, it says there, Therefore I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David. He shall feed them, and will be their shepherd, and I the Lord will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them, I the Lord have spoken. So here's the second thing that Mark the Evangelist connects with here. It's that Jesus is the servant David. He will be this righteous shepherd. That, that will lead God's people and give them what is necessary. So, of course, Jesus, after this, he goes on also to multiply the loaves and the fishes. He also arranges the people into groups of fifties and hundreds. We also encounter that in Exodus, where the captains of the people organize them in a similar way. So, again, there's this connection between Jesus and his disciples, his disciples are like these judges appointed over the people of the Exodus, like Moses did through the appointment or through the captains who grouped the people in fifties and hundreds. There's this Exodus motif. Jesus is the leader of the new Exodus. He is also David, the righteous David. But of course, they receive food in the wilderness. And these are the people who are participating in the new exodus, following their new leader, the righteous shepherd, Jesus himself.